Welcome, I'm Gary Parr, and this week's Fiber Talk show is sponsored by the Embroiderers Guild of America and Needle in a Haystack. And before we get to our conversation with Nicola Jarvis, check out the Embroiderers Guild of America, egausa.org website. Consider becoming a member. I know I, I became a member at large here not too long ago and have really really enjoyed the benefits of the EGA and what they have to offer. To encourage you to go to the EGA website, I'm going to have a little drawing this week, and the winner will receive a Fiber Talk Made Me Buy It t-shirt, and that has to be large, extra large, or double XL. I don't know how many smaller mediums left. Uh, so a t-shirt and two needle minders. And what I'm asking you to do is go to the galleries at egausa.org, the stitches across the site section. And in there, I want you to find your favorite stitched piece, favorite design, and send me a photo of it. So you, uh, if, if you're a Mac user, you just right click and say download photo, and then just email that to Gary at wetalkfiber.com. And the subject line, just put EGA. So EGA, and send me your favorite uh, photo favorite piece from Stitches Across the Site section of the galleries at egausa.org, and that'll put you into a drawing for a t-shirt and a pair of needle minders. And then while you're at the website, uh, check out the Master Craftsman programs. They have 10 different programs, beading, canvas embroidery, counted thread, cruel embroidery, quilting, silk and metal threads are just some of them. Uh, check that out because if you want to advance your stitching and get recognized for it. The Master Craftsman program is an excellent way. And then if you're not sure if you want to be a member or if you're a member and haven't checked it out, be sure and visit the free projects section. And in there, there are 15 free projects of all different techniques. And there are also two books you can download, two PDF books you can download. One is how to color wash needlepoint canvas. That's by Kate Gaunt. And then the other is a Little, a little book of embroidery basics from Patricia Luffholm. That's 66 pages of basics on embroidery techniques. That's a handy little thing to have that you can share with someone who's interested in beginning embroidery. Uh, so both of those are free in addition to 15 free projects. So visit egausa.org. Consider becoming a member. Go to the Stitches Across the Site gallery section. Send me a photo of your favorite piece to get in the drawing for a t-shirt and needle minders, and then definitely uh, go to the free project section. Then when you get your project and you need materials, then you're going to go to Needle in a Haystack. That's uh, needlestack.com and uh, get your materials from Kathy Ray. Now, Needle in a Haystack is one of my favorite uh, businesses online store, but I uh, you have to go to California to get, uh, get in the store, but online Tremendous collection there that Kathy has of threads, uh, ground cloth, and all the tools to go with them, uh, if, especially if you're looking for something that's unusual, uh, hard to find, good chance Kathy has it. Check it out. If you uh, don't have a store nearby and you want to change colors in a project, Kathy can help you with that. Can't find a thread, need a substitute, Kathy can help you with that. So needlestack.com, needle in a haystack. And also, while you're there, be sure and check out the things that Kathy is doing with her laser cutter. She has several pin keeps, needle keeps, and needle books that she is doing with, uh, with the laser cutter. She really does a beautiful job, too. They're not just some uh, thrown together quickly piece with rough edges. She does a beautiful job. The, the, the thread keeps alone, there's plenty, plenty of space to have uh, to put your threads in and get to, get to them easily. She really, but she's a stitcher. She understands what you need. And she has some specifically for hats, hands across the sea sampler charts, Jane Fittis and uh, 1835 and Mary Carter 1712. She has needle keeps, thread keeps, and needle minders for that. So if you want to coordinate, if you're stitching one of those and want to coordinate uh, your accessories, uh, go to uh, Needle in the Haystack and get those. So thanks to both of our sponsors, EGA uh, Embroiders Guild of America and Needle in a Haystack. And now I hope you'll enjoy the conversation I had with Nicola Jarvis of Nicola Jarvis Studio. Well, 
Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and you're listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for needlework artists. And our artist this week from Nicola Jarvis Studio, the Nicola Jarvis. Hi, Nicola. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is going to be fun. Okay, now I look at you. I studied you. Well, yeah, I did. I, I do it all the time. I get sucked right in and don't stop. <laughs> now, you've been, wow. doing, you've been doing this a long time. Do you and, know, I guess I have, yeah, actually. You have. When, <laughs> when, I, You know, when you kind of, you look back and you count, the years that you've been, you know, working um, within the field and you realize this is nearly three decades, 30 <laughs> years. It's, it's, whoa, <laughs> that really is a whole career almost, isn't it? Right. Well, yeah, I mean, you don't, and, and I'm sure you just don't realize it. You're just going thing to thing to thing and uh, the days go by and the weeks go by and you just don't realize yeah, and that that's absolutely how it is. And then suddenly, when you're updating your CV or you're just <laughs> reassessing sort of where you've been and where you're going, what that's happened? When, <laughs> yeah, wow, I'm you know 55. <laughs> oh my, yeah. yeah. So what is it? But the question that popped into my head on my bike ride this morning was, what is it that keeps you going? Is it the designing? Is it the teaching? Uh, is it just, you just enjoy stitching in all aspects? What, there's, what is the drives you to keep going? Cause you know, at some point, uh, 30 years of, of doing this kind of thing, you know, I think you'd start to have thoughts about, you know, I just want to sit in my living room and stitch and just be left alone. Yeah. And some people do have that feeling at certain points, don't they? When they've, they've, they've worked in a career for, right. for a, 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 a long period of time. But I think Gary, with me, I have such a drive to make and create and to um, visualize and realize a lot of ideas that I have in, in my head that that just keeps spurring me on. I have this excitement about making what comes into my imagination happen either in a drawing or a painting or an embroidery or a combination of all three of those <laughs> things and it's just this deep deep need to keep pouring out this visual material I guess yeah. you know um, that comes out in in either a, a pencil drawing or, or a fabric painting or, or an embroidery of one one sort or another. Yeah. So okay. So you're you're one of those that your head is just so full of stuff you can't get it out fast enough. Yep. That's about the long, tall, and short of it, Gary. <laughs> and I think when they nail the lid on the coffin, that you know, they might be able to push you know that lid down, and and my ideas might just sort of you no know, stop seeping out. Who knows? <laughs> you know. <laughs> yep. Well, I mean, it's it's fun because uh, artists. Yeah, as I do more and more, I there's a you can almost categorize them, and and there is that group of of artists like you that you just it just doesn't stop. You just keep seeing it; it just keeps coming to your head, and you have to get it out in one form or another, and you have to share it. And um, I mean, it's fun; it's it's fun. But I can see how that would drive you. It would just I, I can't stop because there's more. Yeah. Absolutely. And for one idea, there are 10 more jiggling in that queue to, to jump out, you know, and you, mm. you it's it's you've got to sometimes you've got to be well, a lot of the time you've got to be selective. And I try and note and make notes and do sketches of all of the things that come into my mind. And it might even be a word or a sentence. I try to just sort of lock the idea or that image down and then I can go back to the sketchbook or that page where I've noted those things and then make a selection from you know that day's ideas uh -huh. of which of which one that I want to push forward one or two of those that I want to pursue let's say so there is a selection process as well as all of this sort of spiel that sort of keeps tumbling <laughs> out. <laughs> so, so you're one with sketchbook, piece of paper, always, always jotting down ideas then. Absolutely. I am and always have Gary. And in, in my um, studio, I have a, a big bookcase and on two of those shelves, say a meter long on two of those shelves are 35 years worth of sketchbooks. Oh my. 
yeah and it's I mean I you know every now and then let's say every sort of six nine months a year I will sit on the floor and pull a few out and go back down memory lane you know of the ideas that I might have had in 1985 and the ideas I might have had in 2007 you know it's it's fascinating uh, interesting to see which ones you know um, actually made it into a, an object or a piece of work and others that just stayed in the sketchbook pages but it's all part of the, the pro of the process and the and the and the 30 year journey and those little sit downs then uh, generate more ideas i assume they and there you go <laughs> <laughs> yes. just feeding the yeah. meter <laughs> yep yeah, that's it that's right oh now, i love the story where as a little girl you uh learned paint sign painting from your dad Oh, and I, it, it's that, very that, sweet. You know, that's just a tremendous start to me. It's sweet, isn't it? And my my dad was, um, he's still with us. He's still alive. I don't see him much, Gary. In fact, I saw him two years ago. Uh, he lives in Munich now. Mm. Um, he was a very driven man, driven by two um, really strong um uh, what would I call it? Music and art. He, he was a jazz musician and an artist, both. He could play the jazz trumpet by ear mm. and he could paint like an angel. And he, he was very, he, he is a very talented man. And um, for a living at the um, beginning of, the, of my mum and dad's marriage, he was a, a sign writer, traditional sign writer for shops and um, for public houses, he would he would uh, paint murals on public house walls and restaurant walls and pub uh, windows and restaurant windows. Um, and he used to do a lot of the work in a tumble down old garage at the bottom of our garden in Rugby. And the garage didn't have any doors on it. So it was just like a, an open big shed. And he would stand there and, and paint and paint these signs in, you know, with his hands, Gary. There was no sort of laser, um, you know, printing or anything like yeah, that, that yeah. there is today. It was all with the oil paint and a beautiful roll of the most wonderful sable brushes. And he would chalk everything out on the boards. And Gary, as a little tiny girl, I would just stand and watch him. I would just stand and watch, mesmerized or curious, you name it. And he would explain things here and there. And he'd have a cigarette hanging out of the corner of his mouth <laughs> while he was doing it. And off he went. And I think you do learn a lot by watching people, don't yes, you? You yes. do things, um, crafts people. And my mum used to say to me when we were in the kitchen together, watch me cook. You sit and watch me. You'll learn a lot before you get stuck in. And she yep. was right, Gary. You know, I learned all my cooking from her by watching her. And I learned a lot of the, the artistic um, techniques from my dad by watching him. And I was, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Gary. So very young. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that was uh, one of the pieces of advice I got uh, during my early days as, an, as a magazine editor. Uh, an old veteran just said, uh, one tip I can offer you, shut up and listen. You might learn something. There, there you go. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm with him. And it is right, isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm testament to that, Gary, I guess. <laughs> but I can talk for England. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's all right, too. So so that, I mean, he's he's really, when it comes to sign making, that's the, in the day when that was truly an artist there. When you, you, you don't You're not doing computer graphics and all those things. I mean, that's just yeah. steady hand and straight lines and all that. Yeah. yeah. And f Gary, knowledge of typefaces and fonts mm -hmm. that he would freehand draw with chalk. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was beautiful. And, and, you know, what, um, what a, what a sort of personal culture to have come from. You know, when I look back at that, I think I was, I was blessed to have been brought up in that environment and I, I, it's not um, a surprise that I've learned to do what I do today and have the style that I have. It's very much rooted in those early years by watching him. Yeah, and, and well, obviously there's, there's a, a genetic artist in you 
but yes, it still it still I, has absolutely. to yeah yeah but it still absolutely. has to come out somehow and it has to be nurtured yeah. doesn't mm-hmm. it and it has to be encouraged and supported and 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 it's sort of nature and nurture isn't it and there is a very very strong artistic line on my dad's side of the family painters um church stained stained glass window painters oh. and and um guys my grandfather's um, who would paint on church walls as well. So they would, you know, paint on the walls behind the altars. Mm-hmm. Um, and also there were tailors in that side of the family as well, Gary. So, you know, we have the needle and thread and we have the, the paintbrush, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, you, you were armed right out of the gate. <laughs> really? You know, when you, you see it's, yeah, it's it's unsurprising when we start to look at it all, isn't it? Yep. And, and I feel very honoured, you know, that... I've been able to continue the line for so long, you know, and been able to make it um, a, a career or a living from it, let's say. Yeah. Now, did that, obviously, you were intrigued and interested uh, at that age. Did did that did that trigger your art interest? Did, did you carry art all the way through school and yes. uh, explore it? Yeah, I, I really did, Gary. Um, I was very hungry. I was just really, really interested. It was, you know, just a very natural interest. Um, I am a very visual person. You know, I love color. Um, I, I love design. Um, it was all around me as a child. You know, mum and dad had what I would say would be great taste. And, you know, they loved art and artists and their interior design flair was was supreme. My dad used to, he could turn his hand to anything, Gary. So he was also a builder. He could, you know, build a fireplace. He could build a wall. He could put in mm. windows. So he, you know, they, they, had a, they had lots of ideas. They had great flair. Um, and so, you know, I think that's sort of where I, I, I that appreciation and that, that love and interest came from. It was fostered there and off it went, you know, yeah. I was always interested in it, you know, um, so not a surprise that, that, that I would be. Right. Well, yeah, you, you almost don't have a choice. <laughs> that, yeah, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, when I first ran into you, which has been some time now, uh, just following your Instagram and, and the embroidery and, uh, I've all, you know, I've, I've, yeah, I've kept tabs on you a long time. Um, but I did not realize the drawing and the painting that goes along with that. And oh. and because oftentimes people will migrate toward just embroidery or, or needlework of needle arts of some kind. And, and maybe the drawing uh, supports that. But you continue in all those ventures in one way or another. Yeah, yeah. It, the the. the... The, the, the art practice, the, the design and the drawing and the and the art practice is it's actually probably the core of it's my core. It's my first response, if that makes sense. And it's the thing that I will start with. So it's something I can't stop doing. I think we said it at the beginning of our conversation. It's I'm sort of on the end of this 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 flow <laughs> a bit like a river and and the drawing and the and the painting comes first. And then the stitching knowledge, which I gained, um, you know, af- sort of I, I bolted the stitching knowledge onto the, <laughs> the drawing and the art, pra- the art flair, if that makes sense, right. the artistic um, uh, vein that runs through me. Um, and the, the embroidery feeds into that artistic practice. The embroidery became a fascinating language to work with and to explore in terms of making um, visual visual images, right? Well, it just becomes another medium for you, basically. Correct. Then. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Another way of mark making, or another way of um, of of building up a texture, either on a page or on a, on a piece of fabric. Absolutely. Do you find that you express yourself better with needle and thread than, say, with oil paint? Oh, a great question. I think. I love them for the different reasons and the different possibilities and the different uh, limitations that they have. I, I, I'm one of these sort of polymaths when it comes to media, media, media. I enjoy it all for its different characteristics and I enjoy sort of exploring the different media. Um, 
and I like to mix them up as well, Gary. I like to cross things over. Yes, so. I've noticed. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's great fun. It's great fun. Well, and, and see, that's what, for me, what puts it at a, at a different level. And, and I've talked to others who do this where it's, it's the expression of the art that's in your head and the medium doesn't matter. It's whatever gets the job done. So if it's a combination yeah. of paint and thread or gold work or whatever it is that gets the job done, that's what you use rather than saying, I just do surface embroidery and I'll find a way to make it work that way. You don't, you don't have that approach at all. No, exactly. And you've nailed it just then. Yeah, it's what gets the job done. And it's knowing that what can get the job done as well, Gary. Yes, yes. <laughs> and that takes years. That takes time because you have to understand your materials and, and you have to understand your techniques. And, and that takes an awful lot of investment. But it's, it's a fabulous path that, you know, I've, I've been on and I'm still on it, Gary. I feel like I'm still a baby and I'm still learning. And I almost feel like, yes, okay, I've worked for 30 years, but oh my goodness, I hope there's another 30 years ahead of me. You know, I've, I've got so much more that I want to express and I want to explore. You know, it's, it's right. really exciting. Yeah. Now, you, everybody I've talked to who worked in the fashion industry left it. <laughs> And of course, I'm, I'm talking to needleworkers, so of course they left it. But help me out there. Did, did the fashion industry work come before Royal School? Uh, what it was came it? Up, it came after, after. Gary. Okay. Yeah, it, it came. It came after the training. Um, I mean, I've I've never left the Royal School. <laughs> right. Um, well, I, I get never... that. I get that feeling too. That all of you Royal School people are. It's like this club. You, it do, is. Do you ever leave it? I mean, no, I don't, I don't think any, well, I think some people do. I think life takes them away from yeah. it you know, very happily um, and they go off and do other things. But I think those of us that do stay close to it or, or have a, a connection with it, you, she's like the, someone said to me once, I think it's wonderful. She's like an eccentric old aunt. She's fascinating <laughs> and you still keep want, wanting to visit her because she's really interesting and She's got loads of stories, you know, it's something like that for me, definitely. And I like, I, I value the training that I, I gained at the school and I, um, I, the, the skills that I gain, you know, I gleaned there and I've built on are invaluable in terms of how I've, that's helped me to shape my career. Yeah. and to shape my art practice. So I, I hope I'm always connected to it. It's quite um, a small connection now, Gary, because I'm so busy doing my own thing. Um, but I still do go back and teach there, and I love going back because I really enjoy everyone that works there. I love Hampton Court Palace, and I think what the, the, the embroidery that the school teaches is, is beautiful. So, you know, it's a positive and very enjoyable relationship that I have with the Royal School of Needlework. Yeah, it's. I get that sense every time, and I'm sure it it's born out of the intensity of work when you first arrive, and to to get whatever certificate degree that you earn, and it doesn't seem to matter what level people uh, finish at, it it's the same result, in that that if if you're there and you you succeed all the way through, then it it becomes part of you. And then uh, even even if you don't go back, if you if you go away and, and do your own needlework thing and uh, and rarely connect, I think it's I, I just get a sense that it's always there in the back of your head, that it's the foundation that uh, from which you everything comes. Yeah, it, it really it really is in terms of the embroidery, um, the in the way that you, you, you make your stitching and in the way that you teach that, you go on to teach that stitching if teaching is what you continue to do. Um, th there is very much a common thread between all of us practitioners from the school. And, and it, as you say, it, it is a club and a, a very rewarding club as well. And, you know, we all have friendships within it. And, um, and I, I've had a great time there, Gary. You know, I've had lots of laughs. I've had a few tears when things didn't go right, you know, <laughs> both with my own work and when I was actually working there, you know, as a as a, an employee 
um, either as a designer or a teacher or on, you know, the, the, the foundation degree. Um, but the, the challenges, I think, um, as, as difficult as some, as some of them were at the time, and there weren't a huge amount, they sharpen you up. They, mm -hmm. you know, they really make you resourceful. They make you pull on parts of yourself that, you know, perhaps you haven't exercised much or so yeah i think it's the good and and the not so good is 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 important as right. well yeah yeah and i've had that sense that uh, sure you come out of there highly skilled needle worker but there's another aspect of it that serves you almost equally well as you go out to develop your own career and and just that uh, is that you you get toughened up a little bit and you uh, really do. yeah and, and and that's incredibly valuable uh, better to yeah, learn it there than than when you're running a business well it was like an, the, the the apprenticeship gary before i went into the fashion industry the, the apprenticeship was a full-time full-on intense job it was a job we we were paid albeit not so much you know it wasn't a huge wage but we were paid to train as traditional hand embroiderers and mm -hmm. we stumped up at those frames at nine o'clock in the morning and we left at five o'clock at night Monday to Friday for three years Gary <laughs> and so if that doesn't tr you know if that yeah. doesn't make uh, uh, make for a, a really solid uh, work ethic robust you know then I don't know what does and it really girded me for the uh, the the fashion industry yeah. Um, it, you know, and, and the fashion industry is, is cut and thrust as you've probably heard oh, and yeah, quite ruthless <laughs> and it did it, it, the training at the school really helped me in the 10 years that I worked, you know, in the British fashion industry. Um, it was a roller coaster ride. It was a fabulous one, but you know, you were, you were fated one day and dropped the next Gary. Yeah. It's as simple as that. <laughs> What, let's go back to the school, though. What gets you into the school? Where? So 30 years ago, I mean, what got me into the that school? That isn't something that just walks in, into your door at some point. You know, you have no, to make a, a, a no, choice. No, you yeah. make a conscious decision. And I, I was 25 when I decided that that was what I wanted to do. And, that's, and the Royal School of Needlework was where I wanted to go. So 25 was quite late to be making up your mind um, at that point, right. um, you know, back in the early 90s, deciding what you wanted to do with yourself. All my friends and all of the apprentices that I then went on to, to study with were a lot younger than me, Gary. I was a bit of a late developer. And the thing with me was I was kicking my heels in the air and drinking and smoking and gallivanting around <laughs> for seven odd years. Um, yeah, I was working, but having a great time while I was, you know, working as a, as a barmaid or a waitress. And then I walked into the Victorian Albert Museum in, in 1990 and walked into the textile gallery and was basically stopped in my tracks mm. by the most fabulous um, Jacobean cruel work bed curtain and a stunning raised work jacket that was worn by a merchant's wife called Lady Margaret Layton. And those two objects, I would say, Gary, changed my the course of my life because yeah. they, that my jaw dropped on the floor and I just thought they're the most beautiful things I have seen. And and. My, wow, uh, I want to draw them, but I also want to learn how to make them. <laughs> so that was your moment. It, that was the drink, moment. Drinking, smoking, and tromping around bars, and that was your moment. That was where that kind of became, you know, l l less important, and the embroidery and the design was just in the forefront of my mind, and I wanted to chase that. I wanted to go and find out more. <laughs> so I found the Royal School of Needlework, um, and I applied for the three-year apprenticeship. And what they were looking for, the, the principal at the time, Elizabeth Elvin, and her, her teachers were looking for somebody with um, a design acumen, you know, a facility with, with color and composition, but had, that someone who hadn't necessarily picked up a needle and thread. Uh, no bad because, habits. <laughs> correct. That's what she said. That's what she said. In, I had two interviews. I had my initial interview with the boss and I took a portfolio of drawings 
And then she invited me back for a second interview. And I had that with the boss and four other of the technical teachers. Ooh, that's a little uh, intimidating, huh? It was. But you know what, Gary? You know when something feels right and mm -hmm. you want something so bad that you'll do anything? <laughs> then okay. It just, yeah, that it, that interview was – it just felt right, Gary. And they liked my work. They liked the, the, the drawings and the paintings. And they just needed to be convinced that a 25-year-old was going to stay the course. Mm -hmm. And they needed to be convinced that, you know, their expensive training, because it costs thousands of pounds to train us, um, was going to be an investment. And I just said, well, look, if you take a risk, I don't think, you know, I, I think you'll be paid, you, you'll be paid off. Mm -hmm. And I, I see the old boss now, uh, <laughs> Liz, and we laugh. And I said, did you did you risk pay off, Liz? And she's, she just puts her arm around me and she laughs. Gary gives me a hug. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's oh, lovely. Great. She took a chance, Gary, and it, and she, and it paid off because yeah. you take a chance on some people and you don't know, do you? Right. And, bl and bless her, she didn't know. But, I, I, you know, I proved I proved it. Yeah. Well, they saw something clearly. They, yeah. they must have done. That's it. They, and, it. and a collaboration, a good collaboration between between you know myself and the teachers, and, mm -hmm. that, and that's what it's about, isn't it? Yep. So you finish your apprenticeship, and then you stay on and teach and work there and for design. a while. Yeah. Yep. Um, designing and teaching both, um, because they they're my they are my strengths, Gary. The designing first. But what I hadn't realized until I, I, I was um, studying on the apprenticeship that I really had a flair, um, a skill for passing on the knowledge, uh, the, you know, the skills. Mm -hmm. And it was the boss, the, the, the boss then, Elizabeth Elvin, who in my first year, she called me into her office in my first year. And she said, I'd like to invite you to, to be my assistant to teach a gold work class at the end of your first year. <laughs> and I could believe it, Gary. I mean, that was scary stuff, Gary. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. <laughs> uh, 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 are you sure? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, you need to just be dropped in the deep end and you need to sink or swim. And I think you'll swim, but you just need to get on with it. And I was thinking, oh, my God, how I don't know very much. And she said to me, you will be surprised how much you know and how much you can pass on. And you know what, Gary, I stepped into that classroom, I was quaking like a little leaf, <laughs> and I watched her just go in, and there were about six or seven students, and it was, um, she's, she was a, a well-known gold worker, Liz Elvin, um, quite, quite a reputation as a gold worker, an ecclesiastical embroiderer, and I, I just watched her go in and, and guide and advise, and I thought, hey, I can do this, mm -hmm. and off I went, and that was it, Gary, that was it. June 1992, that was it. And, and, and I haven't looked back. I really did discover a, a skill or a talent at passing on the knowledge, if that makes sense. And I enjoyed it, Gary. I didn't realize how much I would. And I think when you enjoy something and you're enthusiastic about the subject, you, your students can't help but sort of really right. – feed off that and you feed off them in turn again don't you yep, yeah and it's a cycle isn't it that's so funny because there you are in your dad's paint shop again only it's gold work yeah indeed <laughs> absolutely yeah. all these teachers gary these teachers they're they're really seminal in your life aren't they oh they are and i mean i'm a former uh teacher uh science teacher and you know it's been years since i've taught but to me it's it's still when that door, when you know, when the when the bell rings, the door closes, and it's just you and the and the students. There's nothing like it. It's fantastic, yeah. isn't it? It's a it's a, a very very creative space, and it's not just dealing with the subject. It's dealing with so many other yep. things, isn't it? Psychology and uh, sociology and and emotions and self esteem. And I think in many ways, sometimes, and I say this a lot. It's more than teaching the subject. It's 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 way oh. more than that. Oh, the, the subject it? is almost secondary, I think, sometimes. Correct. Yeah. It really is. And just to make people feel good. That's both of you. Your students making you feel good and you making them feel good. You can you can do so much, can't you, when you've got that really lovely energy going on? Yeah. Oh, there's no doubt about it. And and you're exactly right. It's a two way street. It's not just you lecturing. There's an exchange that goes on and you learn from them and and, uh, and, and yeah, anybody who talks about a teacher, they remember it's enthusiasm. That's what, that's what carried the day. 
It, it, yeah. The teacher was excited about doing and sharing and working with the students. And yeah, that just feeds off of everything. Yep. Doesn't it? Doesn't yeah. it, Justin? As you say, they're the ones you remember and the ones that just, just, just sort of throw you off on a trajectory that you perhaps hadn't even thought that you were going to going to be embarking on. Right. Right. So that, so then you dug right in with this gold work class and you saw what needed to be done and just went for it. Yeah. And I, and I loved it and I buzzed, <laughs> I really buzzed. Like I hadn't buzzed for a while, to be honest, Gary, you know? Um, and so that was, that was something I discovered there and then that was, um, something that I'd go on to to develop was the teaching practice and go on to actually formally study teaching as, um, you know, subject, education as a subject, mm -hmm. which I found fascinating. Um, and and then, you know, develop then the, the, the embroidery teaching alongside sort of building it um, in with, with the understanding of what, you know, what it was, how you impart your knowledge and how you manage a classroom and yes. how you design a course or a lesson. Um, you know, great, great skills. Um, and I've, I haven't regretted, I've, I've, I loved my teacher training and haven't regretted investing, you know, the, the, the three years that I did um, for one moment. It, I felt it really strengthened um, and enriched what my embroidery knowledge and, you know, the way that I passed it on. Oh, I, ha I have no doubt because, yeah, once you understand the mechanics in the foundations of teaching, uh, yeah, then then that really you can really take off. Then, yeah, that's. But you you almost to be successful, I think you almost have to have that shown to you in one way or another. Uh, yeah, because it's not always obvious, is it? No. Even though sometimes you're doing it automatically, you're doing it already. Um, to to be shown new tools and new techniques in terms of motivation and right. um, retention and and um, people taking ownership of a of a particular um, element of their learning that all does have to be broken down and 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 spelled out and re and built back up again, doesn't it? Yes. Well, yeah, exactly. All of that and and. Uh, fundamental to all of it is simply understanding the different ways that people learn yeah. and and having the awareness to select out the students who need to learn visually who need to learn by reading who need yeah. to be told and and being able to deliver that at at all those levels that's right in a that's lot of right. in a lot of times on the fly um, oh yeah. mostly mostly <laughs> on the fly gary especially when you're doing a class just a day class and you've got five hours yeah. with yep. with 20 people and you've got to make those judgments and in, in how as you say how they learn in you know it's split seconds sometimes isn't it yes you know it's very fast isn't it that that processing um and then delivering um it, it's it's sort of quite fascinating isn't it really that you know we do it we do some of it automatically and some of it we pull on you know the studies that we that we had to undergo mm -hmm. oh yeah that's uh to me that well a lot a lot of things i mean i i've often said i would go back to teaching uh, tomorrow given the chance but there's so much other stuff that goes with it that there's no way i'd do it but uh it's that when you stand up and scan a classroom and your mind is is identifying those students and saying, all right, I can see that person struggling and I know that person needs to learn visually. I need to go over there and show and uh, and then and get get that person off the dime and moving forward. And to be able to do that person to person uh, is is it's incredible fun. It's incredible it, fun. It, yeah. it is, Gary. You're absolutely right. It, it is challenging. It's as you say, you get a real buzz from it. You're you're going round that classroom a bit like a sort of circus master, aren't you? In a way. Yes. You know, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Keeping all your plates spinning, aren't you? <laughs> yep. Um, and making sure everyone's happy and 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 are progressing, you know, in the way that 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 they want to. Um, and as you say, it's it's hard work, isn't it? Um, but it's so fulfilling as well. Yeah. No, I, I, I say that people complain about teachers, you know, they work nine months of the year and all those things. And and my response to them every time is, I don't want to hear about it till you've done it. That's it. You give so much as a teacher. Yeah. You give so it's everything. much. It is everything. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. everything's sort of peaking, isn't it? And in that particular session, however long or short it is. Yep. Um, 
But I've, I've loved it, Gary. 30 years, <laughs> I've loved it. However, Gary, COVID-19 yeah. has rendered my teaching null and void. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for, well, they're, they're, for, that's a big club there. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're in a big club, aren't we, Gary? So we're all having to think along different lines in how we, we deliver and how we continue to, to pass on our knowledge. And I'm, I'm in that process at the moment of just yeah. sort of, you know, letting the dust settle and, and reassessing how um, I, I might go forward with that in terms of online. Yeah, Pe- uh, people are it, figuring it out, though. It's starting to emerge. People are getting past yep. the technology yep. and, and making the adjustments, and you you can yep. start to see it emerge, and people are starting yep. to say, all right, I, I see how yep. I can make this happen. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really exciting. It really is. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on it myself. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so then you moved to the cutthroat fashion industry. Yeah, I did. Oh, that, um, that had to I been know. a ride. <laughs> it was a ride. And the thing is, I think because I'd been brought up with a very stylish, you know, parents who, you know, understood fashion both in interior and and in clothing, um, because they like to wear nice things. They like to be up to the minute. You know, they like the house to look nice. Um I absorbed that, and I've, I'd always been interested in, in embroidery um, on garments, and it was something I wanted to explore outside of the Royal School of Needlework. Mm-hmm. So it was something I wanted to pursue and just to see how far I could go with embroidery and the fashion industry in my own country. So did you view that as a, a long-term career, or I'm going to take out of this what I can get? Um, I saw it as long term. I hoped when I started that I would stay in for a, a number of years. You know, I hoped it would be I sort of had a sense it might be sort of five odd years, Gary, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, um, I wanted it to kind of, you know, I wanted to develop it and build build it, which is what I did. Um, and, I, you know, I was in it for nine, ten years, absolute maximum. And it was um, very intense in that there are two, well, there were, when I was working in the industry sort of 15, 20 years ago, there were two seasons at that point. There was the autumn, winter Mm. and the spring, summer. Well, there's multiple seasons now, Gary. (laughs) But when I was working, there were two. And you worked in um, February would be, that, that month of January and February would be intensively for spring, summer. And then the um, August, September would be for the autumn, winter. And you'd be working sort of all night, all day, Gary, for two months. Mm. Um, you know, everyone wanted things yesterday. That I'd have those courier bikes waiting, you know, revving their <laughs> engines on my doorstep, waiting me for me to finish garments and samples for fashion shows and buying reviews. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was, it was hard, hard graft. But when I had worked, Gary, they paid me very, very well. Oh, okay. But it was feast or famine. Yeah. <laughs> so and those, those and those shows are, are the engine, right? Yeah. And those four months that I was working, you know, almost 24 hours a day, almost, let's, you know, not quite, but nearly, that would really, that would, that money that I earned on those, in those four months would have to then last me across the whole year. Right. That, <laughs> yeah. So it was feast or famine. And and that's quite scary, you know. It's mm-hmm. um, it's quite quite a sort of nail biting um, way of living. But you know, I was I was determined to do it because I found the work really exciting, and I found what the designers did with needle and thread and um, the, the cutting edge materials that they used. Uh-huh. You know, I just found that I was learning so much and gaining so much knowledge for my own sort of artistic practice that I just wanted to stay in it for as long as I could. <laughs> yeah. So what did, what do you take out of that, that, that serves you today? Um, breaking the rules, I, I suppose. Oh, okay. And, yeah. Um, doing things, unlikely things, unusual things with, with, with embroidery, using unlikely materials, um, plastics, um, st- string, raffia plant material you know you name it they were 
there are all sorts of really weird and wonderful things that I was being given to create um, artworks on garments that I hadn't encountered at the Royal School of Needlework, which had been very, very traditional. Mm -hmm. and, at, and at the Royal School, I'd only worked with woolen threads, cotton threads, silk threads, and metal threads. That was about it, Gary. Mm -hmm. So the fashion industry, you know, with all its different kinds of sort of plastics and um, all different beautiful fibers and beautiful weaves of all different all different sorts and styles and prints and it, it was such an education in its own right and it just showed me that you could you could work with so many different materials and you didn't have to stay in a very obvious sort of arena of of just what was on offer you know in, right. in, the, in the in the haberdashery shops if right. that makes sense so this fed right fed right into what you do today which is whatever it takes to deliver the vision you have. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely it did. Yeah, it, it, it really did. And and that for me was, I think that was instrumental at that time of really feeding my practice without me really realizing that it was going to, it was really going to come to fruition sort of 10 and 15 years on from that point. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm sure I'm sure it toughened you up like <laughs> like nothing else. Yeah, it, it really did. I mean, the work ethic, I mean, it had been pretty damn good before, you know, right. at school. But, um, you you know, I had to sing for my supper, Gary. And if I didn't do the work, I didn't get paid. And so, you know, and I had a mortgage at that point as well. Oh, so I, No pressure yeah. there. <laughs> so there was pressure on, on, on a lot of sides. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, tough but fantastic. Exhilarating, I think, is is the word I'd use use to describe that period. Yeah. So it, and I assume doing your own embroidery uh, and design along the way. Yeah, and what I'd do alongside all the fashion work, what what I'd get ideas from all the designers, you know, their drawings, their their little samples, and the things that they gave me to create, you know, the garments and the swatches that they wanted. Um, I would then go off and experiment on my own clothes and, mm. you know, I'd be sort of working with some of their ideas and some of, you know, their kinds of materials. I'd go and buy my own sort of equivalents and I would turn up at a party or a dinner party or, you know, the pub in, in my own version of, you know, uh -huh. a Jasper <laughs> Conran top or a, a Lulu Guinness handbag, you know. I was just experimenting with all the things I was learning from the designers, Gary, just sure. taking it forward. And that was great fun, too, you know, doing it on a personal level. So I get all my friends to say, could you do me one? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Do you know I, how I much time it took Gary. to do this one? Oh, Gary, no. I was, I, I'm, there is a soft side to me, Gary. There's a side that can't say no. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, So this... Uh, when when do you make the break? What triggers the break and says, all right, enough of fashion? So what happened um, in 2004, uh, I, I had the apprenticeship certificate and I had uh, experience at the Royal School of Needlework in traditional hand embroidery. Then I had 10 years of um, incredible um, experience in the fashion industry. And there was a point um, just before I was 40 where I said to myself, I really want to go and use all this knowledge in a fine art setting. Mm. I want to go back to school and work with all this knowledge that I've gained over the last 15 years and start to develop my own practice. I was desperate, Gary, mm. desperate. And so I took myself, I applied for fine art courses at the Slade Art School, at Newcastle University, at Glasgow School of Art, at Manchester School of Art. And I got accepted at Newcastle and Glasgow and Manchester, but it was Manchester Art School that I preferred when I went for the interview and I went for the open day. I, do, I just really enjoyed the atmosphere there. Mm -hmm. I really liked the tutors and the lecturers. And that was where I chose to study. And that's where I went and did a BA from the age of 40. Um, <laughs> so I went back to school, but I was also um, still working in the fashion industry and still teaching at the Royal School of Needlework to fund the BA, uh -huh. Bachelor of Arts. So, you know, I didn't stop working really, Gary. I was doing three jobs, the yeah. degree and <laughs> the teach, you know, teaching and the fashion as well. Uh, but you know what I take out of that? 
You never stop learning. No, you don't. No, you don't. And I think, you know, I'll only stop learning, Gary, when I'm six feet under or I'm, you know, that's it. When I cease to exist on this earth. I'm, mm-hmm. and, that, and that's how I see it. And I just think learning is, gosh, there's so much to learn, Gary. The, the more I learn, the more I realize what that I don't know. And <laughs> I think don't so know, many right? people say that, but that's it's the truth, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so, you, oh, so then, then now you're really armed. So you have all that experience and, uh, you go back to school and get your BA. And then yep. it, it, did you, did you have that vision that I'm going to start my own business? I mean, that was where, that was your target. I, it kind of happened. I, Gary, my wish, and my wish is still this is to, to be recognized as an artist. I just want recognition as a, as a person who makes art and I, I wanted to be able to live by my art. And really, in 2004, 5, 6, when I was doing the BA, I, I imagined myself selling my artworks in galleries. Um, I didn't for a moment ever think that I was going to be, you know, launching a, an embroidery kit business. That came later. <laughs> and that's given me an incredible income stream. But I never actually dreamed of having my own little business doing that. I wanted to be a selling artist, and that's why I went back to school to try and develop that. But, you know, other things were, were coming together and other things were, you know, lined up for me that mm-hmm. weren't quite the vision that I had at that time. So after the BA, my tutors on the BA, they said to me, you know what, you are just on such a roll and you have such a strong um, handle with drawing. You know, drawing's your, your language. and you need to just push it even further. Why don't you go and do a master's? And that's what I did, Gary. I um, applied to Wimbledon School of Art on their drawing masters and got in. And it was very, very competitive. Um, it's a very tough course, tough to get on and tough to be, be on. Mm-hmm. But boy, do they whip you into shape. And they are, <laughs> oh my gosh, they were brutal. They really were, Gary. I spent more time in tears on that course than I did, you know, feeling sort of relaxed and happy. But what they were doing was really, they were really sharpening us up because the art world, like the fashion world, it is so tough. It's Mm -hmm. so saturated, isn't it, with talent. And you've got to be so hell bent to to be able to make it. And that's what they were doing with us. They were just, you know, really trying to um, just. They were were saving your bacon in the front end. Yep. (laughs) Yeah, they really were. But they what they did, Gary, is they made me realize what I was doing, why I was doing it and how I was doing it. So I I really located what it was I was up to. And it was very much using drawing and embroidery in order to express myself, you know, in the world, you know, my little world, if that makes sense. So they helped you then uh, step out of your little art bubble and see, see yourself from the outside and say, yes. all right, now, and, and put it in perspective for you. Yeah. And to make us um, aware of what it's like to approach galleries or to, to, um, exhibit your work to market yourself to publicize yourself you know they were training us to be a one-man band publicist you know a maker a publicist an accountant Mm. you know they were teaching us to do everything that it took in order to be, be successful as a practicing artist and to live make a living from it um and what happened was at the end of the Masters, um, the Royal School of Needlework was setting up a degree, as I think you, you, you're you aware, that's that's what they have now, a very right. successful degree mm-hmm. course. And in 2006 and seven, I was invited to be part of um, a course writing team um, to design the stitch curriculum. And then in 2009, um, once the course, uh, just before the course was launched, they then advertised for personnel for people to to help run the course, teach it, um, and there was a an opening for a, a stitch curriculum designer, basically. And I applied for the job, and I got it, Gary, right at the end of my master's. So I finished my master's. Oh, timing is everything. <laughs> timing is everything. And wow, what a fantastic job! What an opportunity, Gary. You know, bringing the teaching. 
right. and the stitch and the drawing together and helping young people to, um, well, situate their own practices, Gary. You right, know? right. Yeah, that's, oh. that's, yes. Yeah. Amazing how it comes together, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yes. And so after two years of being, you know, this, the, um, the deputy course leader and the stitch curriculum designer, I um, saw an advert for uh, a competition that was being run by the William Morris Gallery. Mm -hmm. And it was basically inviting artists from all over London and the UK to make a piece of work inspired by William Morris. This was in 2010. So I was still, you know, working on the degree. And we had a summer holiday and I thought, you know what, I've spent a year with the students. I've done very little art practice. I need to get back on this. And so I made a piece of work for this competition run by the William Morris Gallery. And I, I won, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> I was awarded overall winner. And that was another point that changed the course of, you know, my life and career. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's no small thing to win uh, affiliated with the William Morris uh, organization to win something that has their name on it. That, that's yeah, that, that means something. It, it was significant, and what it afforded me was a my own solo exhibition three years from when I won the prize. Mm. That was the prize. Oh, it was. Oh, so oh boy. Yeah, oh. that was. Yeah, I. You know, normally when you enter an art competition, normally there is a cash prize. Sure. For the the first, second, and a few of the runners up, but this prize was not cash. It was an opportunity. And Gary, that opportunity has just served me over the last 10 years. I cannot tell you. It might as well have been 50 grand of cash, really, in, uh -huh. in the doors that it opened. You know, I, I can't quantify it really in money, but it's just been phenomenal in terms of raising a profile. <laughs> um, so so the, the prize is effectively more work, but the payoff after that is significant. Absolutely. You're, you're, yeah, you've, you've nailed that one. Absolutely. <laughs> so is this where, uh, is this where the, uh, the birds come from? Yes. Uh, see, and yeah. you're, you're one of these people now we're going to run out of time. We're going to have to do another show because there's a whole, a whole bunch <laughs> Gary, of stuff I'll, we have to explore. I'll come and talk to you again, Gary. You just, you just name the day and <laughs> okay. I'll be there. Okay. So, so t tell how the, I got to know about the birds before we go. I got to know about the birds because, okay. Well, I mean, you know, that's what people talk about, but th there's a reason for that. The birds, so the birds came from this William Morris exhibition. Well, William and May Morris, because it was the William Morris Gallery that hosted the exhibition. But the curator, who had been one of the people to help select me to, to you know, win the prize, she, when I won the prize and went and had a meeting with her, and she said, right then, Nicola, what are you going to do for this solo show in three years' time? <laughs> And I said, well, do you know, I have heard about and I know a little about her, a tiny little bit, little bit about this lady. Her name is May Morris, Mary Morris, and I believe she's William Morris's youngest daughter. And I've read that she was an embroiderer and she was a teacher and she was a lecturer and she worked at the Royal School of Needlework just on a on a part time, very part time basis. She would go in and she did a bit of designing and a bit of lecturing for the Royal School. And I said, you know, there's a lot of parallels with her and myself. And I'd like to look at her instead of William Morris in terms of, you know, informing my mm -hmm. exhibition. And she said, that'd be fantastic because May Morris has not enjoyed, you know, she's been in the shadows of her father, because he is ubiquitous, isn't he? Yeah, that's a big shadow. <laughs> you know, it's huge. And yet this lady, in her own right, Gary, was so accomplished. She's such a beautiful artist, a fabulous designer, a wonderful embroiderer. Mm -hmm. And the curator and myself and many others who are associated with the gallery said, it's about time we pulled her and all of her work out of the dusty archives and, and the collection and shook it out and shone a light on it. And... And had a look at it again and reassessed it again in you know in the in the in the in the in the two thousands and so that's what that's what I did. So what I did was I looked at a lot of her work. I went to uh, the Ashmolean Museum, 
the archive and collection in the William Morris galleries and all of the stately homes like Whittick Manor and the Red House and uh, Kelmscott House and Kelmscott Manor. Those institutions and houses who, who hold a lot of her work, uh, both embroidery and drawings and paintings, I got a real sense of what she was about and, and her, her, her style, which is very similar to her father. And I, I started to realize that she advocated that artists and designers should work from life in order to create original artworks and designs. She was a huge advocate of that. Mm. And so I started to draw um, plants and flowers from life. I started, you know, very much as she uh, she um, sat down and she, had a, she wrote a book called Decorative Needlework. And she said, you must draw from life if you want to make original work. So I thought, right, I'm going to do what she says. I'm going to draw from life. So I started drawing all these plants and flowers, Gary, for months and months, lovely sort of botanical drawings, all very intricate. And I thought, well, these are very beautiful, but, you know, loads of people do this. It's not that original, is yeah, it? Yeah, I was going to say. Gonna, what am I, I going to do with this? Yep. So I, what I'd started with, I, I drew this beautiful anemone. It was, it was um, 2011. It was April, and I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to collage some William Morris and May Morris patterns onto the petals of this anemone flower. And I started to do that, and I thought, well, yeah, this is pretty. This is nice, but it, oh, I don't know. There's, it's not really doing it for me. It's mm -hmm. not really got the magic. Mm -hmm. So I kept doing my still life drawings and sort of playing around with the collaging of these of these patterns on these flowers. But alongside my still life drawings, Gary, I was watching the little birds in my garden as mm. a light relief, as a way of relaxing between mm -hmm. all this painstaking observational <laughs> drawing. And I started to photograph my little robins and my little blue tits and my little blackbird and my little sparrows. And in the end, I had these lovely photo body of photographs of these cute little garden birds. And I thought, well, they're so sweet. And I took the robin and I thought, what would happen if I collage some William Morris patterns onto his head, his wing, his breast? Mm -hmm. And Gary, that's how it started. And uh -huh. suddenly I got my little robin with willow pattern wings and tulips on his head, you know, and that's the point where it all started to come together and make sense. And I started creating something that I thought had a real magic and sort of something that was very compelling. And Gary, from that point, it just literally like the birds, it flew <laughs> and they were born. And this whole sort of aviary of birds started to appear uh -huh. in drawings that I then thought, oh, my gosh, I've only got a year to stitch these if that's what i want to do <laughs> oops <laughs> yeah hey, yeah oh my and there's only me so that's when you call on all your friends <laughs> and i emailed and called and said guys how do you fancy being part of a collaboration whereby if i send you a drawing a color drawing of one of my little birds or collage with william and may morris patterns would you like to stitch it in cruel and surface stitches and silk work and gold work and I approached 30 stitchers, Gary, and 30 stitchers agreed to work with me. Wow. And what, what they got was the piece of work after the show, their name in lights, their name and work in the catalogue. So they had a spotlight as well. Mm -hmm. So it was a nice platform for them and a different, possibly a different way of working, um, you know, different colour palette, a different subject matter. And off we went, Gary, and without those 30 ladies and gentlemen i wouldn't be where i am now really and that show was the richer for that collaboration yeah oh i can imagine that yeah yeah and and, the, and i feel that's where the magic really started to happen was was my work with those stitches and the stitches would use their own initiative and they'd write to me and say hey you know you've drawn this here what do you reckon about this instead of what you've put go for it i'd say that's there's some yes that's even better you know and off <laughs> it's like teaching off you go don't you right right no that that's so interesting because you you said those two words beth ellicott and i have been talking 
here recently in a couple of shows about creativity and what what it what makes it what kills it and uh it's that what if like like you you sat there and you said wait a minute what if i take these birds and and this thing i'm trying to do with this anemone what what if yeah and, and, it and really being was. Yeah, being willing to just jump in and see what happens yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you know what, Gary? There was a year I just had to start taking some risks because what was driving <laughs> me was the fact that there just wasn't that 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 magic. You know, that stardust wasn't appearing. Yeah. And I I, I had to force it a little bit, if that makes sense. You know. Well, but I also I think so, because sometimes the, sometimes pressure brings out creativity. It's okay. It, it <laughs> totally does, doesn't it? And also your experience to spot. That's something that you you take a it's a hunch, isn't it? You take right. a risk on something that you think, do you know what? This could this might just work. Mm-hmm. Yep. No, that's uh you know however you get there, but I can understand the the pressure uh, to be doing something with the Morris people, and I mean you can't just do an average exhibit. You you got you got to deliver something. Yeah. You've got to you have got to make a statement you've got to sort of represent ideas haven't you you know represent mm -hmm. um, they've got to be fresh haven't they they're not new they're not original well they are new but they are they're represented in a different way aren't they it's a sort of remix of things isn't it that yes. sort of seems fresh and new at the time doesn't it so, right. um Yep. No, that's uh yeah, well, it worked. Good for you. Yay. Oh, you well, you and you and 30 other people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, oh, thank goodness. Yep. Well, Nicola, we're going to have to stop there, but yeah, we definitely got to do another one. There's uh, Oh, yeah. it'd be lovely, Gary. I'm so, time has flown, hasn't it? When you yes. when you're having fun and enjoying yourselves <laughs> and you're having a great conversation, it just runs away, doesn't it? It uh, it does at that, yeah. When you mentioned uh, before we started about we got to be ready to go for an hour, oh. I thought, oh, this will be over before you know it. Yep. Well, a real <laughs> pleasure, Gary. Lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been lovely to share, to, you know, share parts of my life and and my and my work with you.